Now, there is one woman in the Bible who was consumed by bitterness. And this bitterness led her to do a great evil to a man of God. Herodias, King Herod's sister-in-law, is a woman who had anger and hatred in her heart towards John the Baptist. In Matthew 14, we read about how John had previously rebuked Herod by reminding him that it was unlawful for him to be with Herodias, so Herod had him put into prison for her sake. Herodias must have not enjoyed being convicted of sin, so she decided to take matters into her own hands. Matthew chapter 14, verse 6 to 8 says, But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company and pleased Herod, so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. I want you to notice how bitterness and anger had so consumed Herodias. When her daughter danced in front of Herod, he promised to give her whatever she would request. Herodias took this as an opportunity to take revenge on John, persuading her daughter to ask for John's head on a platter. Her daughter did as she had requested, and as a result, John was beheaded. It's difficult to comprehend that a disagreement or a word of rebuke from someone else would motivate a person to murder. But this is how bitterness works. It causes that person's heart to grow cold, leading them to become irrational in how they think and behave. Herodias hated John so much that it clouded her mind and allowed her to take extreme measures in order to satisfy her pride and self-importance. She wanted the life of a man of God simply because he disapproved of her actions. Though we may not be murderers in the physical sense, our words, thoughts, behaviors, and actions may be causing a great deal of harm to other people. This bitter root can cause us to kill people's hope, joy, determination, and dreams. What we say to people and how we treat them can have a negative and long-lasting impact on their mental, emotional, spiritual, and even physical health. How we treat others comes from what is in our hearts because the Bible says in Matthew 15, verse 19, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Sometimes we share our evil thoughts and intentions with others, inviting them to play a role in the execution of the sin. That's what Herodias did. Not only did she commit the sin of intending to murder John, she made her daughter participate in the evil act. She used her relationship with her daughter to her own advantage, influencing and manipulating her to make an atrocious request which would end the life of one of the greatest prophets. Herodias' actions are an example of how an ungodly woman can use her position or power to cause destruction. However, a godly woman influences those around her in a positive way, acting as a peacemaker and leading people towards God in the way of righteousness. A godly woman considers the outcome of her actions. She takes care not to do anything that would displease the Lord. On the other hand, Herodias directly opposed God by killing John, who was Jesus' cousin, but most importantly, a genuine and righteous man of God. She was blinded with evil and did not fear God, allowing the darkness in her heart to determine her steps. She didn't think of the consequences of her actions. She had no regard for God or anyone else, but a righteous believer fears the Lord and treats his people with love, care, and respect. We can be sure that what Herodias did directly offended God because John was a godly man. God did not take what she did lightly. Psalm 116, 15 reads, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. So what can we take away from all of this? What lessons can be learned? Through the example of Herodias, we can clearly see that a resentful heart leads to sin. We need to examine the condition of our hearts. If we find there is any unforgiveness in us, 
we must let it go. We need to forgive that person or those people and choose to forgive them every time we remember what they did or said to hurt us. Instead of holding a grudge, let us turn to the Lord and pray for those people, asking Him to intervene and bring justice where it is needed. Remember and be encouraged. The Lord fights for us. Moses told the Israelites in Exodus 14, verse 14, The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. What an encouraging word and a beautiful reminder of how strong our God is. When we hand a situation over to Him, He takes full control. As well as being called to forgive, Christians are expected to be the light of the world in Matthew 5, verse 14. The next verse says that the light gives light to everyone in the house, and that is what we should strive to do with our influence. The power we've been given through the Holy Spirit should be used to influence everyone around us in a godly way. How can we do this? By listening to and obeying the voice of God when He asks us to take action. Where wisdom should be shared, we are to give words of godly wisdom and speak scriptural truths. Where someone we know is contemplating evil, we should rebuke it and redirect that person towards the light. Where there is an opportunity to make or break peace, we must choose the peaceful way. We must never use our power or influence to commit or promote evil like Herodias did. What is more, we should never oppose the work of God. If a righteous man or woman points out a wrong way in us, we should heed their advice instead of feeling insulted and letting our pride take over. We are called to be humble and to serve, not to see ourselves as better than others, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us be supportive and respectful of one another, honoring God by honoring each other. Lastly, let's live by Paul's words in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 and 15, which says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. Two of the most destructive emotions for a believer are anger and bitterness. Part of why these emotions are so destructive is that they may go unnoticed until it is far too late. Hebrews 12 verse 15 says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. A different translation says, Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Appreciating a good biblical analogy takes your understanding to a whole other level. Notice that this verse doesn't even warn us to be cautious of bitterness itself. It implores us to be cautious of the root of this bitterness. Paul was careful and intentional in his use of this analogy. Let's consider the life of a plant. Usually, we can't see a seed after it has been put into the ground, nor its roots but we do see the fruit and flowers when they pierce the earth and come above ground. Much like bitterness, the root of a plant is not visible to the naked eye. We may only be aware that a seed was planted when we see the fruit. Paul knew that bitterness was so destructive that it needed to be uprooted as soon as the seed germinated. He didn't warn the Hebrews to dispose of the fruit of bitterness. Oh no, he knew that when you see the fruit of bitterness, it's much too late. You see, if we wait for bitterness to be visible above ground, we risk being a threat to others. This is why the Bible says, see to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. This means that before bitterness even gets to the surface, we should eradicate it. Before bitterness wreaks havoc in the church, it would have destroyed the individual. 
Before bitterness ruins a marriage or an individual, it would have taken root in someone's heart and grown and grown and grown until it's now so developed that it's visible for all to see. Have you seen someone blow up really dramatically out of seemingly nowhere? What you are seeing is the fruit of a seed of anger or bitterness which had been germinating for a long time and had eventually grown roots. That anger and bitterness had gone unchecked for too long and made a grand appearance at the least opportune time. What differentiates fruit from vegetables is the fact that fruits have seeds. Bitterness allowed to grow and bloom unchecked will only produce an opportunity for more seeds to be planted. This is an absolutely vicious cycle. One act of anger and bitterness can potentially plant multiple seeds of bitterness in so many other people. This world has made it so very easy to become bitter. How many young people are drowning in bitterness then due to the rise of social media? The accomplishments of others are right in our faces, and we need to guard our hearts when we notice the beginnings of negative emotions at the sight of people's highlight reels. And let me just say this. Someone's blessing should not be the cause of your envy or jealousy. We are all God's children, and the Lord deals with us differently, but we should always, always be on guard against bitterness. It doesn't matter what the seed is. It could be pain, betrayal, comparison, or envy. Whatever it is, do not let the root of bitterness to settle and produce fruit in your life. Ask for the Lord to purge you. Now, I'd like to talk about anger for a moment. Proverbs 22, verse 24 says, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered, or you may learn their ways and get yourself ensnared. This scripture is well supported by 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, which says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Perhaps you have been responsible. You've done the work, and you are effectively curbing your own bitterness and anger. Unfortunately, the work doesn't stop there. You can make all the progress in the world. If your company is filled with bitter, angry people, you run the risk of being entangled in their weeds. Jesus himself knows firsthand what it is like to have some short-tempered friends. In Luke 9, Jesus was making plans to go to Jerusalem, so he sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. However, the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. When James and John heard this, they actually suggested to Jesus that they call down fire from heaven to burn these people up. Jesus had to rebuke them and stop them from their own impulsive behavior. The Bible doesn't tell us not to be angry. It tells us not to sin by letting anger control you. This is because anger can be like a wildfire. It leaves destruction and ruin behind. Think of the alcoholic father who comes home drunk and in a rage to his family. How much trauma and destruction does he cause in the lives of his wife and children? Think of the woman who, in her anger, says some of the most hurtful words you'll ever hear. Anger is a strong emotion, and an emotion that us, as children of God, should be guarded against. Anger should not be your default emotion in times of difficulty or inconvenience, but we should be a people who are sober, self-controlled, ruled by love. The love of God and love for one another. Bitterness and anger are extremely toxic to a believer. They have far-reaching consequences. It is our duty to stand guard against these seeds as soon as they fall on the soil of our hearts. So here's what I encourage you to do. Pray for the blood of Jesus Christ to wash away any seeds of bitterness and anger from your heart. Whatever someone did, pray for the grace to let it go. Whatever hurtful words someone said about you, pray for the strength to forgive and move on. Pray for the Holy Spirit to sweep away all toxic emotions from your life. And above all, pray for the love of Jesus Christ to fill your heart.